My name is Jared Abdurrahman, and I am Sabahan. In May this year, internet sensation and artist Red Hong Yi shared with me her intention to paint a particular structure in the heart of Kota Kinabalu. The structure, consisting mostly of roofless pillars or stilts, are the remains of an old pre-war colonial building. Having survived the Jesselton bombings in World War II, the building was eventually destroyed by fire almost 50 years later. She wanted to paint it yellow. Bleary-eyed in the first dawn of New Malaysia, the plan was now a little uncertain. Yellow, or maybe red, white, blue, and yellow would be more appropriate. You see, the purpose had shifted from that of protest to that of celebration. However, given the public holiday, most paint shops were closed, and those that were open didn't have the colors we needed. Okay, okay, let's take a step back and think about it for a bit. What are we trying to do? What are we trying to achieve? If we're gonna do something, why don't we put some actual thought into it? After months of back and forthing our ideas, we veered away from the original impulsive solo artist project and settled on a more polished, more deliberate community artist endeavor. And so, Pillars of Sabah was born. 30 pillars, 30 artists, and a community united in celebration of being Sabahan. Those who inspire us portrayed facing outward onto the world, greeting a promising future of change, and ourselves portrayed facing inward, acknowledging our identity, acknowledging who we are inside, Sabahan. For me, as an organizer, it wasn't just an exercise in bureaucracy and executive decision making. For me as an artist, it wasn't just an exercise in skillfulness and creative vision. For me as a human being, it was personal. As an attempt to revisit a distant past, to preserve a neglected heritage, to celebrate a suppressed identity, the project echoed my own personal journey my own personal homecoming. I was born in Kota Kinabalu to a Sabahan father and an Australian mother. And it's upside down, no wonder. In Kota Kinabalu is where I was raised. But I didn't go to a local Malaysian school, no. I went to an international school, a British international school, because that's what you look for in a school when trying to decide if it's good enough to provide an education for your children. How British it is. <laughs> sure. Only thing is, though, is that my Malay sucked. At the age of 12, the extent of my Malay was, Nama saya Jared. Saya suka main bola sepak. That was okay, right? I mean, who needs to learn the language of the natives when you have a good, proper British education? Of course, this is all fine and dandy, so long as your parents can afford it. But what happens when your parents can no longer afford it? What happens when your parents run out of money? Like, say, in a financial crisis, for example. 1997, guess what happened? Asian financial crisis. Cheerio, British education. Selamat datang, Malaysian education. Have any of you seen a fish out of water before? For most of us, it's the overwhelming sensation of, oh, oh dear, that fish needs help. I think I should probably do something to help it. Followed by but like, oh my God, I don't really want to touch it. <laughs> and then we continue to watch as the fish dies a painful death. I was the fish. If you think learning is hard, like actual learning, new concepts in maths and science, well, imagine having to do all of that in a different language, a language 
where your proficiency is the equivalent of Nama saya Jared. Saya suka main bola sepak. So, there I was, thrown headfirst into the deep end of the lion's den, armed only with my name and what sport I like to play. And of course, I didn't stand a chance. But not because my Malay was lacking, not because I was so far behind in the syllabus, but because I was white. Thanks to the physical appearance of this thing, the color of my skin, eyes, and hair, I was singled out as an outsider. I was reminded on a daily basis that I belonged elsewhere, that my place in the world was elsewhere. And eventually I believed them. If I didn't feel like a foreigner before this, I was sure made to feel like a foreigner then. A foreigner in my own country. Sure, children can be mean, but what excuses do teachers have? Over the years, being conditioned to feel like I wasn't part of the team, I took to athletics. The individual nature of the sport offered me the only kind of solitude that was socially acceptable. And so I trained. Day and night, on the track, where the smell of the rubber running surface met with the smell of sweat and even blood, I trained. I trained to push pain out of my body. I trained to push thoughts out of my mind. I trained to push people out of my life. And when I stood on the podium carrying their colors, singing their anthem, perhaps then they would accept me. After high school, I moved to Australia, to the land of my people, to where I actually belonged, finally. And life was good. Life was fine. Life was as it was meant to be. Or so I desperately hoped. Go back to where you came from. I'm sure some of you will have heard this before. And if you're particularly lucky, multiple times. Go back to where you came from. They said this to me. Me. But they told me to come here. So how? You know, it eventually dawned on me that apparently I look like an Arab. Or a curry muncher, as some particularly creative Australians like to say. On the street, a guy just asked me casually if I had a bomb in my bag. A bomb. So, if Australia didn't want me, and Sabah didn't want me, where on earth was I supposed to go? To Antarctica? Yep, I went to Antarctica. <laughs> I mean, when penguins and seals and albatross tell you to go away, it's just not quite as hurtful as when people tell you to go away. It was the best and worst three months of my life. But apparently there's some law that says that you can't just stay there forever. So yeah, I went back to Australia. And if Australia really didn't want me, I wanted to hear it from an actual indigenous Australian. Or because I was living in Tasmania, I wanted to hear it from a non-European descendant of Tasmania's indigenous population. But, of course, we all know that that was never going to happen, considering the mighty European invaders saw to it that the last full-blooded indigenous Tasmanian died more than a century ago. Good job, guys. Eventually, the years turned into a decade, and I found myself on autopilot but not the kind of autopilot that keeps you in one job while the rest of the world passes you by. Rather, 
the kind of autopilot that's activated when you're trying to get from point A to point B and between the two is a maze. The most confusing, most intricate, most complex maze in the world. Life, the maze of life. I started out point A, knowing where I wanted to go, point B. And I had a pretty good idea of how to get there. But as the years went on, the difference between turning left and turning right seemed negligible. The different path options seemed more and more similar. Hmm, left or right? It doesn't matter, I'm lost anyway. Autopilot activated. It didn't matter what I did, which direction I took. I was never quite satisfied, never quite fulfilled. I had to keep turning, keep moving, keep on keeping on. I took a break from athletics because it just wasn't the same. I distanced myself from research because I became disillusioned with the political infighting within the scientific community. All so that I could find myself working backstage at the latest reality TV show Wondering how I got there. And let me tell you this, reality TV is the worst. It is the literal worst. It took me five years to realize that one. <laughs> Not to mention all the other jobs that I had along the way that just aren't worth mentioning. Retail assistant, customer service assistant, petrol station attendant, Supermarket attendant, general laborer, pizza delivery driver. Yep, I was even a pizza delivery driver. But don't get me wrong, these are all very admirable employment options. I have a lot of respect for people in these roles because these are the people we rely on every single day to uphold our consumer-centric lifestyles. For me though, these jobs were a means to an end. But to what end? Stepping stones to where? The next stepping stone? So there I was, working backstage, listening to the producers gossip about the contestants, wondering how I got there, unsatisfied, unfulfilled, yet again, what did I do? I packed my bag. I made my way through Japan, through China, up Mongolia, across Russia, through Europe, eventually settling in the UK, where I lived for two years, almost two years. And during which time, I tried to do as much travel as I could. I traveled Scandinavia, north into the Arctic. I traveled the Mediterranean, east into the Levant. And the funny thing is, what I found was, the more that I traveled, the more I realized that I didn't want to identify myself as Australian. You see, what you come to realize when you're traveling the world is that what Australian means is a surfer dude in a singlet, board shorts, thongs, <laughs> a Southern Cross tattoo somewhere on his body, keen to tell you about that one time he escaped the shark, only to then wrestle a croc to the ground. Croy key. This was not me. Of course, not all Australians are like this. But rather than having to explain it over and over again, I found it easier just to say that I wasn't. But if I wasn't Australian, what was I? At the end of my visa, I reluctantly packed my bags and made my way back to Australia. And on the way, I thought I'd stop by KK just for a little bit, spend time with my parents and my sister. Because uh, while I was away in the UK, uh, my dad was up a water tower one day, checking on the water levels. And he slipped and fell, landing on his side, hitting his head. His cracked ribs were the least of his worries, because internal bleeding, bruising around his heart, his lungs, his brain stem, had to be drained. It was a very long process, but 
eventually he was discharged. The swelling in his head, however, impacted his brain, which in turn affected some of his cognitive abilities, like especially his ability to communicate. This effectively meant that he was forced into retirement, but this also meant that my mom and my sister had to look after him. So I thought I would just come back, spend some time, just for a little bit, just say hi, just for a few months. One year later, I'm still here. So what happened? The more time I spent here, the longer I was here, I realized what it was that was missing in my life. I'd been living with a hole in my heart, and I never quite knew how to fix it. So many times I tried to cover it up, to sticky tape it together, but there was only one thing that could properly fill it, the thing that was removed in the first place. Being back here, I could feel that hole slowly being filled. And slowly, piece by piece, I could feel my sense of self, my sense of place, my sense of purpose returning. That thing that was missing in my life, that hole in my heart, was home. You see, what I'd done was I completely disassociated myself from my point of origin, from where I was born, where I grew up, where I laid the most crucial building blocks of my identity, I locked it up, threw away the key as a kind of coping mechanism. It didn't matter if I knew where I wanted to end up. If I didn't know how I got here, where I'd come from, I'd just be going in circles. And I was. I realize now that in my journey, in my story, Sabah is not just the prologue. It's the process. It's the premise. It is the spine that holds it together. The mountain, the rainforest, the people, the beautiful people. Like the pillars, they serve to remind me who I am. And like the pillars, they serve to inspire me towards who I want to be. My name is Jared Abdurrahman and I am Sabahan.